Hello students, welcome to The Analyst, dated 10th of August 2023. Today, we'll look at five important articles from the Indian Express and the Hindu. The first article will be regarding the initial public offering. The second article will be regarding the National Research Foundation Bill 2023. Then we'll look at renaming Kerala or renaming of states. Then we'll look at two prelim oriented articles. The first one is deforestation in Amazon and the second one will conclude with Bharat Mata painting. Now the first article relates to your GS3 and it is particularly related to your financial markets. Now why is it in news? Because SEBI, the market regulator, has halved the IPO listing time from six days to three days. In this context, we must appreciate what do we mean by shares and we must have heard terms like shares, equity, stocks, right? In general parlance, they all mean the same. Now, why do we need to issue shares? So let's say there is a company C. The company C raises some money from a venture capitalist or from an angel investor. Now, why would an angel investor or a venture capitalist fund my company? Because maybe my ideas convinced the people or my prototypes were liked or cumulatively my business expertise and the potential of my business has been identified by them. So due to multiple factors, anyone can fund me. But at this stage, who is funding me? These are typically private individuals. Or corporate entities. Now, let's appreciate why do we need capital? So let's say I built a prototype, I'm supplying goods and services. My business model has become successful in a very small scale. Now I want to scale up or I want to diversify. Diversify into new sectors. Scale up maybe in the same sector, go big. Or it is about, let's say, I want to acquire a company or I want to get a technology or maybe I want to get some land for my new plant. So I would require a lot of capital to further expand my business. Now we must also appreciate that in the initial gestation period of a business, we require much lesser capital. So let's say my initial rounds were of 10 crores and then I raised 40 crores. But now given that my business has become successful, I want to enter new geographical markets. Let's say I was only operating in Delhi NCR. Now I want to enter Bengaluru or I want to go all India, pan India. So I will need capital and I am capital starved. Now, <clears throat> the best way to raise more capital based upon a very good business experience is a initial public offering, an IPO. Now, how do I raise money through an IPO? So, my primary method of raising money has been to get money from investors or I can take up a loan. If I take up a loan, I have to pay the principal and the interest. But if I give you equity or I give you shares, then I give you ownership. Ownership as a percentage of the shares you hold, right? Now, if I give you ownership, in return, what are you giving me? Capital. But as a company, how would I get this capital? So I need to tap into my primary markets. So to tap into the primary market, I will go into a initial public offering and I will let the world know that this is my business. This is my business plan. These are my financials. And I will ask you, 
to support me. Now, who can invest in these companies? So let's say me as a retail investor. Or let's say a very big fund house. Let's say a sovereign wealth fund is convinced that I am building a good business. So can the Abu Dhabi investment fund, can they invest in my IPO? Can they buy my shares and in turn give me some money? Yes. Then can high net worth individuals, HNIs, can they also fund me? Yes, naturally. Now, can the president of India also invest in me? Through let's say LIC or SBI? Very much so. So, in the previous model, I asked few investors to invest in my business plan, showing my prototype business model. Now that I have made it successful and now rather than raising 10 or 40 crores, now I require 1000 crores. So now I still have the option of raising the same amount from, so raising 1000 crores from the same group of investors. But in this case, my company will remain private. But if I feel that my business model is successful, the market will appreciate it. It may also help in scaling up. Then I might go for a bigger, I might tap into the biggest market. Why? Because all the investors who invested in my company, they, co they can also get new shares, right? Then your sovereign wealth funds can also participate. LIC, SBI can also participate. And the volume, the large number of population of retail investors, they can also participate. Now, <clears throat> let's say I, I want to now go for an IPO. Who will ensure that my IPO is going through? So the market regulator, SEBI will be overseeing it and some investment banker or merchant banker along with some, some anchor investors. Let's say I want to go for an IPO. I would hire companies like HSBC, Morgan and Stanley, JP Morgan and Chase or let's say HDFC Bank, ICICI Securities, right? So I'll ask these, one of these banks or a combination of few banks to handle my IPO and to make it successful. And what do I mean by making an IPO successful? That let's say I am offering the market 1000 shares and I want that my 1000 shares should be bought. That no matter what, who is buying, I just want my shares to be bought. Why? Because I want to raise the amount of money, right? So these bankers, they will help me in going through the IPO. And who will regulate? It is the SEBI. Now, once I have raised, once I have gone for IPO, so I have offered the market 1000 shares, okay? So anybody in the market will get these 1000 shares or the combination of a lot of people. And in return, I get 1000 crores. Now, I will go through my business expansion plan, etc. But the moment I have given these 1000 shares, I got the money. Now, let's say one of the person who got the share is, is me, right? So X got one share. Now, the initial price of this share was 1 crore. But due to high market demand of the share, why? Because I have a sound business model. So, it is a simple game of demand and supply. If I have a good fruitful business and the, the market sees good potential in my revenues, in my EBITAs, then what will happen? Then the market will appreciate the price of the share because of high demand. So maybe after one month, the price of my share is 1.2 CR. Now, if I sell this share, uh, if I sell this share to anyone at 1.2 CR, then I will make 20 lakhs of profit. So 
I invested one crore, I got a 20% return. Maybe in one month, maybe in one year, right? So that is the benefit that a retail investor or an institutional investor gets, returns, right? But now, mind you, this share will be bought by someone at 1.2 CR, but the company will not get any money. Why? Because I was the owner, I was the owner of the company as a holder of one share. So I sold it to someone that someone gave me 1.2 CR. Company is nowhere to be seen. Company has issued the shares for the first time and it has got the money, right? So now we are essentially discussing the secondary markets. So let's say I want to buy shares of Zomato. So Zomato's IPO has already happened. Right? So initial public offering has already happened. But now I want to buy Zomato because I see good business potential. So where do I get it from? From the secondary markets where it is easily traded. So your National Stock Exchange and Bombay Stock Exchange. And who facilitates these transactions? So it is the brokers. So when we are talking about Zerodha, we are talking, talking about Grow or upstock so these companies are essentially brokers right now <clears throat> what are the benefits of these ipos so first of all me as the owner of the company i want to show to the world what are what is my business all about so i want to go public and I want to share both the profits as well as risks with a large group of people. So by risk I mean we need support of more people rather than few investors because the few investors which got into the company at the early stage now four years have passed and they want a return so the moment i am going for an ipo usually the people who have entered earlier they tend to they tend to sell their shares right just after ipo after there is a cooling off period now so i am i will i am promising that if i have any profit if i expand Naturally, I will share it with everyone who holds the share. But as an investor, as an investor, what kind of benefits can I reap? So I can get stock dividends. I can get stock splits. I can get bonus shares. These are basically programs to reward your loyalty. And these are corporate actions to say so. Or simply the increase in stock prices due to demand and supply. What else? It helps our entrepreneurs, innovators to monetize. To monetize their work. So let's say we have created a startup. Now usually what do we see? that startups are running through a cash burning stage. But let's say after, during the cash burn, I had four big investors. They invested in me while I was burning cash. Now, I am moving towards profitability. So right now I am below uh, profitability, but gradually I am moving towards profitability. So now, my investors will also like to make a return on the money. Furthermore, I would also want more money to invest in the same company. But these people, they are already exhausted monetarily. They want returns now. So I am letting the world participate. I am asking the world to become a part of the growth story. So it is essentially democratizing profits. It is essentially sharing profits with wide variety of people. The only limitation is that you can only participate in the market when you have money. Right? Now, <clears throat> what happens when we go for more IPOs 
is that our own companies are able to raise capital domestically. Furthermore, it prevents debt traps. Let's say taking expensive foreign loans. So it avoids debt traps. Furthermore, it is about sharing profits also. Now, let's say I went into the primary market with the IPO. Then my shares are freely traded across the NSE and BSC. Now, I still want to get more money. So I can go for a FPO, further public offer. So again, I will consult my investment bankers, my merchant bankers, and they will again go for a follow on public offer and new shares will be issued. So the moment new shares are issued, I will again get money as the company owner, right? Now let's look at the second article. Second article is regarding the National Research Foundation bill. The bill has been recently passed by the Lok Sabha and the Raj Sabha and it is yet to receive the assent of the president. Now in this regard, we must appreciate what is a bill. So a bill is a proposal of enactment before the legislature. So let's say I want to make a law, I want to enact a law. So what I'll do, I will present it before the parliament or the legislature. If the parliament, both the houses of the parliament, they approve with simple majority and I get a assent of the president, then it becomes a act, right? Now, the first context that we understand is why do we need R&D? Why do we need research ecosystem? And how do we go about R&D in world? So let's say I have an idea. So can I protect my idea? Let's say I am walking down the street and I get an innovative idea. I'm very excited about a project. I will start a new startup, right? Very happy about it. Now I discuss it with my friend and then my friend also discusses it with someone. And eventually what happens? The idea was really brilliant and the friend of my friend, he started a business, right? Can I go to any authority, to the courts or anyone saying that that was my idea? No, absolutely not. Absolutely not. Ideas cannot be protected. Ideas are non-patentable. You cannot get a patent of your idea. You can have thousand ideas in a day. So what do you need to do about it? So idea is basically the ideation stage where you have clear ideas about a business model. Then you go into prototyping or you can say testing. Then you finally go for a launch. In the launch, you are essentially going for what? You are going for a market test, right? Then you will look at whether I have created something, whether I have done some innovation. And if at all, I have done any new, I have come up with any inventive step or I have brought some novelty into the process, right? Then what I'll do is I'll apply for a patent. I'll go for patenting. Now, <clears throat> let's say my idea has converted itself into a product with testing, prototyping, market research, etc. I have identified that there was a void in technology, that there was a void in market also. And I have created the product also. I've done market research also. So the next, that means 
I have actually done a innovation. And how do I identify that it is innovative or not? So I go and look out for what has already been done. That is called prior work. So if there is any prior work or prior art that has already happened, let's say someone has already made the technology and is already protecting the technology, then it is not innovative. But let's say this much technology is already available. But on top of the technology, I created a new layer, a new layer of technology. So this layer in itself is innovative, right? Now, please appreciate the moment I have gone for innovation, I need to protect my innovation. Why? Because I did not protect my idea. I cannot protect my idea, but I should protect my innovation. Why? Because what is the outcome of all that work? It must be somehow monetized or utilized. So going with this particular layer, I move towards my patenting phase. So I apply for a patent. Now at this stage, you must appreciate that a patent is a sovereign right. And it is territorial. So let's say as a drug manufacturer, what I have done is I have created a new chemical. Okay, a new compound I have created. I have synthesized the chemical in my labs, in my research and development labs. And now I want to protect it. So I'll apply for a patent. But where do I apply the patent? So I will go country wise. I have to go country wise. That simply means that if I have a patent protection of 20 years, but that patent is for India, then my product and my entire technology is only protected for 20 years and it is only protected in India. So now what I'll do is I will go for patenting all across the world, all the major markets. I'll go for a patent application in US, one in EU, one in Japan, one in let's say Turkey, let's say one in South Af Africa. So I will go and try to get more and more rights more and more patent rights from individual countries depending upon my own market research. And what is that research? My potential to grow in the world. Let's say my drug can make the world TB free. And it can be a very cheap drug also. Then I will go for patenting all across the nations where TB is very prominent. Right? Where you have more cases of tuberculosis. Now, now that I have gone and got my right, now my innovation or my research and development has been protected. And in Indian context, it is the Patent Act, right? Now, it has been protected very well. Now, what I'll do is, I will try to go for a production but let's say I am a scientist in IIT Khadapur. Okay. Now I do not have time to go for production. So what can I do? I can license it. I can license the technology, the innovation that I did. I can license my patent. And in return, what will I get? Some royalty. Some royalty. So what essentially I am doing, I am monetizing I am monetizing my research and development. Now, let's scale back a little and let's try to understand why do we need all of this? Why this is so much required for India, for Indians, for Indian companies, for our startups, for our entrepreneurs. Why do we need it? Because let's take the example of US and in particular, the case study of semiconductors. So you will see that in semiconductor manufacturing, there are three tiers. The top tier of semiconductor manufacturing is 
research and development and that includes your patenting so you will see that majority that more than 90 percent of the technology the critical technology the state of the art technology which is which has not permeated to other parts of the world is held by us uk so no matter which phone we use no matter which semiconductor is there in your phone who is manufacturing it doesn't matter but to design the chip they had to get the technology and how do i get the technology by paying a fee by paying a royalty agreement so is it not rent so i create a technology and on top of that technology for next 20 years i am a i'm protected and b i'll sell it to anywhere who gives me money so education turning into knowledge knowledge making more innovation more research and development more funding on research and development going for patenting going for patenting of what critical technologies dual use technologies military tech space tech AI tech, EV tech and what I'll do is I have invested billion and billions of dollars. I've got all the patents. So no matter who manufactures the EV, no matter who goes for a semiconductor fabrication plant, who is assembling semiconductor, whether it is Vedanta or it is Foxconn, American company will always earn through royalty and the moment someone goes and reverse engineers your innovation, you also get money through a lot of lawsuits, right? You go for patent infringement suits and you get again millions of dollars when you see any kind of infringement, right? So that is why if we want to create a knowledge economy, where innovation is rewarded then we need to spend more on research and development and the spending cannot be top down that means it cannot be only from the government but it must also come from the private sector Right now, let's look at the Anusandhan National Research Foundation. So, what the act does, it basically is repealing the Science and Engineering Research Board Act. A then it dissolves a body called Science and Engineering Research Board. So, board has been nullified, repealed the act, and created the National Research Foundation or Anusandhan National Research Foundation. In short, we can call this NRF, National Research Foundation. Now, <clears throat> what is the idea behind this National Research? So, it will be apex body and it will provide the strategic direction. So, let's say I identify that there are 10 gaps. 10 gaps. Between what? Between, let's say, the global north north by north i mean the west let's say us uk okay let's take simple examples and the global south let's say india south africa brazil right so there are 10 technology gaps that we can see where west has succeeded and it is let's say three or four decades ahead of us so i need a strategic direction that I need to do more research and development towards helicopters. I need fifth generation aircrafts. I need boots, multi-purpose boots. I need sunglasses for my soldiers, for our soldiers. I need aerogel induced jackets. I want lighter bulletproof jackets. I want assault rifles which are lighter 
and which are more resilient to dust, sand, heat, etc. So strategic direction based upon need, based upon what can be the demand of future in terms of what is the exact demand from the R&D community in general. And when I say R&D community, it involves our institutions like IITs, IISCs, AIMS, the top institutions, the institutions of national importance. It also includes our private sector. When we are talking about Bajaj, when we are talking about Hero Motor Corp, when we are talking about the Reliance Industries, so the private sector coming and chipping in research and development. Then it also involves all the governmental institutions which are which are streamlined only towards R&D work. So we need cohesion between all these organs and most importantly to the students. Let's say someone is studying space technology, someone is doing sp space engineering. So they must know what are the five key sectors where we need innovation. What are the key demand areas that this country requires? So strategic direction is absolutely required. Then it is for research, innovation and entrepreneurship. That simply means that the idea is not just to innovate or just not to go for research, but to go for outcomes. Outcomes like entrepreneurship and finally innovation. So I can research for 50 years, but not innovate. And there must be promotion of entrepreneurship simultaneously. Now, the fields are naturally. So all aspects of STEM, including natural sciences, mathematics, engineering, technology. Most importantly, humanities and social sciences. So we are seeing that there is a lot of tech development. But now the idea is that tech must also look at the social issues. Let's say to innovate, to get India rid of, let's say, open defecation or manual scavenging. So using technologies to also address our social gaps, to not only look at the technology gaps that we have as a country, to not only look at the convergence between the private se sector, intelligentsia, government sector, but also to address the social gaps, right? Now, the funds, what will be the source of funds? So grants, loans from central government, then donations, then income from investments of amounts received by foundation. So let's say this foundation likes three to four startups which are which are working in social sector. So because of dearth of fund, they are not able to scale up. So let's say the NRF goes for funding of these startups. Now at certain point of time, they might also become profitable. So naturally, they will receive some royalties because of their investment. For example, LIC as a company, it will invest in multiple companies. And over the period of time, the shares, they, they, they improve because of the size of Indian economy has troubled, uh, you know, multiplied multiple times. So what will happen? The size of companies have changed. So the investments have also multiplied. So let's say there is a startup working in uh, social sector, working in manual scavenging. And at certain point of time, it also uh, goes, go, goes to scale up and become big. So what will happen to the funds? To the, uh, to the funds offered by the National Research Foundation. So it will also earn dividends. Now, this will be audited by the Comptroller or Auditor, Auditor General of India under Article 148. Now, there'll be a governing board and there'll be an executive council. The executive council which handles day-to-day -day affairs and that will be headed by the principal scientific advisor. On the other hand, the governing board will be headed by the Prime Minister of India. So strategic goals, not tactical goals, but larger directions are to be provided and sector wise. Then other members include your union minister of science and tech education and your principal scientific advisor and secretaries of multiple ministries. So this the structure of the board that can become a prelim pointer as well. Now we look at the third article and this pertains to your GS2. Now, why this is in news? Because the Kerala Assembly has passed a resolution and they want to change the name of their state to Kerala. 
from Kerala to Kerala. Now we must appreciate that this is this news is coming from the part one. The discussion will be pertaining to part one and more specifically to article three. So article one reads name and territory of the union. Second admission or establishment of new states and third formation of new states alteration of area boundary or names of existing state. Now let's look at how are states renamed and we must look at the bare provisions of article three. So let's try to do some reading. So formation of new states, that's the title. This is called the title. So formation of new states and alteration of area, A, boundary, B, names of existing state, C. Now, <clears throat> please appreciate that this article three is a classic example of India's quasi-federal nature. So we time and again say that in our quasi-federal nature of Indian constitution, which is sui generis in nature, it is unique in itself. We have a dominant center. More powers are with the center. So this is a very good example where the center or to say so the Indian parliament has higher rights when it compares to states. So article three formation. Now A says to form a new state by separation of territory. B says increase the area of any state. C says diminish the area of any state. D says alter the boundaries of any state. And E most importantly alter the name of any state. So who has the powers? So in accordance with article three, these powers are exclusive. They are extremely exclusive to the Indian parliament, right? And after the amendment in 1955 only, the role of state legislature was also appreciated. Till then, it was seen as the power of the central legislature or the parliament. Now, let's look at E. So provided that no bill for the purposes shall be introduced in either house of the parliament except on the recommendation of president. First point, then where the proposal contained in the bill affects the area boundaries or name of any state, the bill has been referred by the president to the legislature of that state for expressing it, its views. So let's now understand how we will go for a new state formation or uh, how we go about changing of name of a state. So first way is that the parliament may directly want to change the name of the state and therefore the bill will require the permission of the president. So without the approval of the president, such a bill cannot be passed. Now, once it is up for discussion, the president will ask the respective state legislature to give its opinion in let's say a prescribed time the prescribed time has not been mentioned so the president will tell the state legislature just let's say you give your opinion in let's say 60 days let's say the state legislature says absolutely not we don't want to change the name of the state then should the president agree socially politically speaking it should be it should be agreed upon but constitutionally it does not bound the president or the parliament so it is for opinion it is for consideration it is not binding on the parliament or the president got it so that is the first perspective. So the state says no, still the parliament wants to go ahead. It can go ahead with simple majority. Again, you don't require a constitutional amendment under article 368. This is simple majority. Now the state says, okay, we also want the change of the uh, name. So the parliament says, okay, fine. Or it can say, no, we don't want to allow you. 
सो अगेन द पार्लियामेंट इज फ्री टू एक्ट इन दर्ड केस लेट से स्टेट गिव्स नो ओपिनियन इन सिक्सटी डेज देन द पार्लियामेंट इज फ्री टू गो अहेड इट इज फ्री टू गो अहेड इफ देर इज नो ओपिनियन इन द स्टिपुलेटेड टाइम द अदर वे इज दैट the state legislature can pass a resolution with majority with simple majority saying that we want to go for a change of name now there are no criteria for why you want to change your name okay constitutionally speaking there is nothing of the reasons for change of name or what is a good reason or what is a bad reason or what is a lawful reason what is a unlawful reason so reason has not been specified but the procedure is that the resolution will be passed by the so the state legislature is basically telling the parliament that we want to change the name right now two options either the parliament will act it will not act or it will be kept in abeyance no response or it will say no absolutely not or it will agree to it so again we see that the center has more power in all the cases however we have seen that the change of names or ch alteration of boundaries etc are extremely sensitive issues and therefore it is advisable to have more discussion debate on such issues and it has been historically seen that there has been more debates and only after the debates were settled such boundaries were altered and whenever such debates were not settled it further aggravated the issues now <clears throat> the resolution says that in malayalam the state is named keralam that is the first idea second is that the idea is to again look at the basis of language so reorganization of states in 1950s the basis was always linguistic then the demand for a united kerala for malayalam speaking communities has been strongly raised right from the days of freedom struggle however the name of the state in first schedule what's what is in first schedule so name of all the states union territories etc is still kerala now there are other reasons for why this resolution has come up one one school of thought says that this is only political motivation second school of thought is it is about reinvigorating the culture of kerala now let's look at the fourth article so amazon nations to jointly fight deforestation this pertains to your aspects of environment deforestation climate change etc so such case studies become extremely important fodder material when you are writing your answers this is a quality enrichment kind of article that you can add to your notes now <clears throat> what is the context so amazon basin nations are trying to combat deforestation together now what are what is amazon so amazon is a river and this river has a wide basin basin comprising of tributaries and distributaries so large area of land is covered by this river and this region is also extremely forested and forested with old growth forest that means natural vegetation is there it is not trees which were planted by human beings but natural vegetation of the region furthermore it is also called this region is also called the lungs of the earth why because it houses the amazon rainforest 
So when we look at biomes, whenever we are looking at biome, so we would look at equatorial rainforest or wet evergreen rainforest. So the region is so much wet that it, re it receives on a daily basis there is on a daily basis two peaks of rain every day it rains equatorial region now every day if it will rain so what will happen a very big network of drainage of river and that is your amazon river so it is like mother to south america now <clears throat> what has been happening over the period of time is that Amazon rainforest, even though they are called the lungs of the earth, they have been degraded. They have been deforested. Why? So let's try to look at some reasons why there is massive deforestation. One is gold mining. So gold mining, gold rush is a very big issue. Then plantations. Plantations of soy. Why do we need soy? Soy because our animals. So we want to consume meat. Okay. We want to consume meat in let's say uh, lunch, dinner, breakfast, right? We want to have bacon. Okay. And who am I? I am a US citizen. So I want bacon. So <clears throat> this soy will be cultivated in these regions. Okay. By deforestation. And the soy will be fed to pigs for fattening so these are fattening agents so you feed they become fat and you get more flesh that is the industry so the meat industry is dependent upon soy and soy is cultivated in these regions illegally then naturally these are forest so logging logging is also there cutting of trees then we also want infrastructure why because we want to connect all these areas why because infrastructure development is seen as, as a way for developing people, by connecting people, by bridging gaps, by diffusing more economies, connecting to nodes. So if I connect two cities, what happens? Maybe an intermediate city can come up. Or maybe both the people can collaborate to bring new businesses all along the highways. So trans-Amazonian highways. So, highway. What else? Slash and burn. What else? Forest fires. Some natural, some artificial. Natural, why? Because of climate change. And artificial, why? Because I want to burn the forest so that I can cultivate it. Why? Because I want to make more plantations. Then ranching. I will make too much of money if I can clear one acre of land. I can make these soy plantation there and in vicinity I can go for my ranch where I have pigs. Right? Because I want to send this meat to US to earn in dollars. So compromising your natural heritage for making money for livelihood. What else? So drug cartels. What else? Narco gangs. So narcotics gangs, organized crime, all of them together. And the mother of all, political corruption which is helping in terms of more oil drilling. So all these factors. Now, over the period of time, we have appreciated that climate change is a reality and it is already here. We are looking at by incessant rainfalls. We are looking at flash floods. We are looking at cloudbursts. So now the idea is to save your forest to 
rejuvenate your natural ecosystems. So what they have done is they have come up with Amazon Corporation Treaty Organization or ACTO and they are basically promising. So very big keywords that we will cut down on deforestation etc. But what is important is Amazon Corporation Treaty Organization so it can come as a mnemonic ACTO. So ACTO comprises of eight South American countries and these countries are essentially part of the Amazon basins and the idea is that this critical environmental buffer should be protected and they have promised in Brazil recently that they will halt deforestation, promote sustainable development and combat organized crimes. Now please appreciate that none of these issues can be solved if there is if they do not follow a basin approach a river basin approach so all the countries must act together and with same intensity if i keep on adding carbon while others are following sustainable development that does not solve the problem right now let's look at the last article of today so the bharat mata painting i took up this topic why because <clears throat> the term bharat mata was multiple times referred in the no confidence debate so no confidence debate is going on between the opposition and the treasury benches so their bharat mata was referred now why should we know bharat mata so because of the bharat mata painting so this painting was created in 1905 by Abandinath Tagore and it basically depicts a saffron clad woman resembling a sadhvi and the sadhvi holds four different elements in hand a book, paddy, cloth and garland and basically 1905 is the context of your Swadeshi movement. So it is about that Atmanirbhar approach, self-sufficiency. Now, <clears throat> the painting symbolizes the idea of Bharat Mata or Mother India. Here, essentially, we are saying that India or Bharat or we can say Bharat that is India is what is like a mother to us. That is the moot point. Okay. And was created in Swadeshi movement as a response to partition of Bengal. Now, it is a very important advice that whenever we have such watershed events, watershed events like non-cooperation movement, like Swadeshi movement, it is advisable that you take up all the other aspects of these movements. For example, social movements, cultural movements during the larger watershed movements. This helps in quality enrichment over the period of time. And this painting has been described as an attempt to humanize Bharat Mata, portraying her seeking liberation through her sons. Right? I hope it helped. Thank you so much.